The gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 to 46. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, but a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leaves it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants, they said to him. Will he put those wretches to a miserable death and leave the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time? Jesus said to him, have you ever, have you never read in the scriptures, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing and is it amazing in our eyes? Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to, the, to a, a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Anybody willing to pray for the preacher this morning? Here comes Alexa. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us together on this beautiful autumn day. Thank you for sending Pastor Terry as a sheepdog to help keep us where we need to be. Lord, please be with her today and tomorrow and throughout the days of facing hard memories and hard situations. Fill her with your love and peace and comfort and direction. And let her hear your message, even as she proclaims it to all of us, your message of love, which is for us, for her, and for all of your children. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for that. I am such a grammar nerd. It's the thing when you're an English major. You just have to go around correcting everybody. It's like God gives you a red pen, and you just go around circling mistakes. Hopefully not. I've been called a grammar Nazi, which I really don't like that one. But um, one of my favorite gospels is Matthew because of all the similes. What's a simile? Anybody know what a simile is? Everybody's saying, like, I'm not going to say anything. She's an English major. She might get out a red pen and say wrong. A simile is something that is like something else, saying you are like a breath of fresh air. You are like whatever. What's a metaphor, then, if that's a simile? Metaphor is... Clark, you want to answer that one? You look like you got it on the tip of your tongue there, buddy. Nope. <laughs> He's going, um, nope. Okay. A metaphor is what happens in Isaiah's passage today. Let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning his vineyard. It's not saying that we're like a vineyard. It's saying we are a vineyard, being the planting of God. What does it say? He 
planted a vineyard on a very fertile hill. If you're planting something on a fertile hill, it should grow right, yes. He dug it and cleared out stones, planted with choice vines, built a watchtower in the middle of it, hewed out a wine vat in it. It's a lot of work, isn't it, that God has gone to? And what does God expect if you're going to do all that work? How many of you have ever prepared a garden that just did not work? I have. You know, you all, everything you plant grows very well? No. You know what that's like, right? But this is really a disaster because God says, I expected it to grow grapes and it yielded wild grapes. Sour, nasty little wild grapes. What more was there to do for my vineyard than I have done for it? Well, that's what's answered in the simile. It says it's another parable, and a parable really is a simile. But before I talk about the parable in Matthew, let me just say a word about parables. They're not exactly, you can't find a parable that is exactly who God is or what God has done because it just doesn't quite work out that way. And one thing that we tend to do is interpret parables wrongly sometimes. We're going to get to that in a moment, but we're like a vineyard that's been planted with a wine press in it and built a watchtower. Where have we heard that before? Every Jew who heard this would have understood that that was coming from Isaiah's prophecy from the fifth chapter. The harvest time comes, he sends his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. Now I said before, parables are like jokes. You either get them or you don't, right? And people would have been listening because there's always an absurd moment in a parable. And the absurd moment here is that this landowner sends slaves to collect his money. And what do they do to his slaves? They beat him up and kill him. So he sends more slaves. What does happen to those slaves? He beat him up and kill him. The absurd moment is when he says, I know what I'll do. I'll send my son. They wouldn't hurt my son, would they? What kind of father would do that? If they've killed your slaves... What are they going to do for your son? So they would have been listening very intently to hear the answer to that because they thought it was something funny because it was so absurd. And Jesus says, oh, this is about you. And they really don't like that, do they? Have you ever been the butt of a joke? Have you ever been ro the recipient of a roast? I was wondering about roasts. It's different if it's a comedian who's being roasted by other comedians. But sometimes you think, wow, that's pretty harsh, isn't it, when they stand there and make fun of you. And they're waiting to hear who the bad guys are. And it's like Jesus says, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone of the Lord doing. It's amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from who? From you. Given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. Because God's looking for fruit from us. Meaning God's looking for our works, for our hearts to be in, what, in line with what we're saying. Our actions to match our words. It's going to be taken away from you. And where I said we have to be careful how we interpret this, I actually read one commentary this week that said, it's obvious what this means. This means that the kingdom is being taken from the Jews and given to the church. No, it does not mean that. Trust me, it does not mean that. I took that book and tossed it onto a pile to go into the recycling bin because that is not what this means at all. Now, Hitler liked to believe that's what it meant. That's where he blames a lot of the Jews for a scriptural reference. He would use this as one of his passages to say, well, God is rejecting Israel. No, God does not reject Israel. God rejects religious insiders, and that includes us. People who speak one thing and act another way. And sometimes that's who we are, isn't it? So let's go back. What does it say in Isaiah? What more could I have done? That's what God has done for us. He sent his son. So how do we make sense of this whole thing? I think we find it in Philippians, what Paul says. Paul says, I'm a Jew, people. Surprise, surprise. I was a persecutor of the church. I was from the tribe of Benjamin. I am a Pharisee. I am all these things that should get me in. And in terms of the law, nobody here has kept the law better than I have. But it's not about the law anymore. Is it? It's about knowing Christ. He says, all that is lost because I have Christ. Christ. I am Christ. He is mine. And so I press on to that goal. Like Jackie was talking about the kids running, keep your eyes on Christ. There are things that will derail our passages and there in the world, things that make it hard. Grief is one. Health is one. You turned on the news yesterday. You saw that Israel is at war with Gaza again. More war in the world. That's what we need, isn't it? More war. Political unrest is something to worry about. You got one party saying this, the other party saying exactly the opposite. So 
So you're either here because you think Donald Trump is a nitwit and he's going to destroy democracy, or you're here thinking crooked Joe Biden, because that's where we are in the world right now. We fight each other all the time. It seems like there's no way forward, but the way forward is not to look in that rearview mirror like Jackie said, to keep your eyes on the prize that is Jesus Christ. It's hard to do, isn't it, sometimes? I told you, you know, tomorrow's the anniversary of my husband's death, and yesterday would have been my mother's 90th birthday. It's also the seventh anniversary of my husband's life support being disconnected. They told me he was going to live five minutes. He lived two and a half days. I sat there with him the whole time and tried to memorize every part of him. That's something that can get in the way, but all I kept thinking the whole time, I heard, I heard Susan Bale, who is a pastor in the conference, singing in my ear. In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You could have all this world. Give me Jesus. I heard her sing that, and I called her up and said, would you like to see my husband's funeral? She said, yeah, what do you want me to say? I said, give me Jesus. She said, I love that song. And she sang it powerfully. When I come to die, when I come to die, when I come to die, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all this world. Give me Jesus. What gets us through, folks? Looking to Christ. Looking to him and him alone. Because God sent his son that we might have life. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my part in an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and life is worth living just because he lives. That's a powerful message there that we sang this morning. And we're pressing on the upward way. New heights we're gaining every day. Still praying as we onward bound. Lord, plant our feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and help me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. At the end of the service, we're going to sing one of my favorite hymns of all time. It's a newer hymn written by the Gettys, who are an Irish couple. They live in Nashville now. They believe in writing hymns, which is setting scripture to music. Not just a praise song, but setting scripture to music. They write strophic hymns, meaning they have verses. We're going to sing it together. In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my health, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, the solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm, what heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ I stand. Matthew's Gospel is not my favorite. It's my second favorite because it gets a little edgy near the end. This is a story that happens, this parable being told. It's part of a set of three parables in this, this um, chapter. We skipped one because we had a guest speaker, the one where the two sons, the father says to them, go and do my work in my vineyard, and one says yes and does not go, and the other says no, but later goes. And he says, which one did the will of the father? So We've got to ask ourselves, if we're not, we can't say it's the church is above all reproach, the church is perfect. The church is wonderful. We can't say that because it's not about the law. It's not about adherence to the law. It's about knowing Christ and putting Christ above all else, which means we've got to love each other desperately. Anybody here know William Cheney? I know Jackie does. He was on conference staff for years. Now he's in a church. He's been making up a series of memes that he puts on his Facebook page every day. I love them because they all are the same. You are ridiculously loved. One a couple days ago said the church is a messy mess and everything's in the world scary, but you are ridiculously loved. You are ridiculously loved, folks. Christ loved you enough to come and die for you, each one of you. We've got to hold on to the kingdom by spreading the kingdom, by sharing the kingdom, by loving one another as desperately, as ridiculously as Christ has loved us. So that's why we're going to sing this morning about Christ, the solid rock upon which we stand, that's what the choir sang. What more could I have done? That's what the vineyard owner asked in Isaiah, and God answers that. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to bear our sins, to open the way to life eternal for us. But we've got to help other people focus on that truth. Tell us that it's our truth. We've got to say this is the truth for the world, and Christ loves each of you ridiculously. When's the last time you told a stranger how much they're loved by Jesus Christ? You haven't done that in a while. Maybe you need to do that. Maybe go out to lunch today and say to your waiter or waitress, you know you're ridiculously loved by God. Like you're nuts. Good for you. Be a little crazy for your Savior because Jesus came to you that you might have life eternal. So go into the world to proclaim the ridiculous love of Jesus Christ. 
Amen, amen, and amen.